Listen, I'm really excited this morning. I, I want to introduce myself. If we haven't met, my name's Anders. I'm one of the pastor elders here. And I just want to greet you, Calvary. I'm, I'm excited that we get to be the body of Christ in this place together this morning. And let me personally welcome you once again. I just want to, I want to let you know this. Our desire here is to make a big deal of Jesus. Because you know what? He is a big deal. Am I right? And so I have to admit, I share the sentiment of Paul in Ephesians and Colossians. When I hear about your faith in the Master, Jesus, and your love towards all the saints, I get so pumped up with thankfulness, and I pray for you. I pray that He would keep it going, and that He'd fill you with knowledge and open your eyes the eyes of your hearts, to know this incredible hope to which we've been called. This is the hope we hear about in the word of truth, the gospel. And guess what? It's on the move. The gospel is being moved forward in the whole world. It's bearing fruit and it's increasing. You can check me on it. Check Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 through 18 or Colossians chapter 1 verse 5 through 9. So in the midst of many battles, we have much to be excited about because the gospel is on the move. We have much to be thankful for because God is at work. Amen? So listen, nudge somebody next to you and let them know the gospel is bearing fruit. Go ahead, say it, encourage them. The gospel is bearing fruit. Well, if you didn't know... We've been working our way through the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, and we want to take God at His word. We want to let Him tell the story of who we are and His intentions for us. Turns out the truth is more glorious and life-altering than we ever imagined. Following Jesus with all your heart, let me say it this way, it will mess you up. And it is beautiful. Am I right? So it's unfair. It's so unfair we call it grace. And it's so compelling, we count everything else rubbish in order to get it. It's eternal life we're talking about. It's a righteousness that's not our own, and life being ever aligned with God's character, and it's all for God's glory. This is what comes off of the pages of the Scriptures. So we're going to keep digging into the truth of the Scriptures this morning. Is that okay? Before we do, would you jump in and pray with me that God would quicken our hearts to His Word this morning? Father, if you don't show up here this morning, we're lost. We're sunk. We don't need a a fancy preacher and we don't need um, smoke and lights. We need you, Jesus. We need you, God, to move here and to stir in our hearts because you're the living God and you've created everything we see, everything we know. And so I'm crying out to you in this moment that as truth is proclaimed from your word, you would do something with it in each of our lives. That Holy Spirit, you would open the eyes of our hearts that we would know the hope to which we've been called. I ask you, God, to be with us and to lead us in these moments together. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this morning we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 6. We're in verses 14 through 18. And so if you'll turn there in your Bibles, we're going to stay in that passage. And I want to let you know this passage gives us today three areas to focus on. First of all, we have an exhortation. We also have an explanation. And we have an action. So the exhortation is right there in the beginning of verse 14. And it says, stand therefore. That's an exhortation for us. Then the explanation follows it regarding the whole armor of God. And then... By verse 18, we have the action that we're called to. And what does it say at the beginning of verse 18? Praying. Praying. So we're going to go through those things this morning together. And if I were to sum it all up for you right now, and if you wanted to get out of here early, you could just take this and go. But if we summed it all up, we could say this. Stand firm, suited up, praying hard. Why don't you say that with me? Stand firm, suited up, praying hard. That's what the scriptures are calling us to this morning. So let's get into this, and let's start with the exhortation in verse 14. Ephesians 6, verse 14 says this, Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and it goes on into the armor. Stand therefore. So I don't know if you've noticed the thrust of Paul's final sentiment here in Ephesians, but it's pretty clear. By verse 10 in chapter 6, he now comes to the expression of his final desire. Verse 10, he says, finally what? 
Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Verse 14, stand therefore. Can you tell what Paul's getting after? Be strong, stand, withstand, to stand firm, stand therefore. He is making himself clear. The exhortation is, stand, be strong in the Lord. And I ask the question, what does all of this truth and application matter unless we stand our ground? Unless we endure? Unless we're the last man standing? And don't forget how. It says, be strong, what? In the Lord and in the strength of His might. So Paul said to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 3.8, he said, for now we really live if you are standing firm in the Lord. And Paul spoke this way in a lot of his letters. It's what he ached for as he ministered the gospel. He wanted to present everyone blameless in Christ, complete, mature, standing strong. So you see by verse 14, here's the exhortation. Keep it going, stand firm. Stand, therefore. Now the question is, why? Why did Paul see it as so needful? What was it that was creating such an urgent desire for him? And our brother Butch laid it out so well for us last week in his exposition of the previous verses. Verse 14, he says, not just stand, but he says, stand therefore. He's building that on something. Verse 13, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Why? Verse 12, because, he starts verse, verse 12 with the word for, because or for, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. If you didn't know before, you should know by now, there is more to reality than meets the eye. There is a fight going on and there is a foe who wants to take you down. Therefore, stand firm says the scriptures. And I don't know if somebody told you that becoming a Christian meant that things would be easy. That if, if you trust in Jesus, you know, the sky's going to turn all rosy and everything becomes like peachy keen all of a sudden. But you know what? It's not so, is it? Preaching on this very passage, Charles Spurgeon once said this. He said, to be a Christian is to be a warrior. The good soldier of Jesus Christ must not expect to find ease in this world. It is a battlefield. So we're not in a cakewalk. We are in a wrestling match. The Greek word actually in verse 12 translated, it, it, we see it as wrestle or in some versions struggle. It's actually unique to this passage. The only place used in the New Testament, it's from a root that means to, to vibrate or to shake. But the word was actually used in everyday Greek to talk about a wrestling match. It's about two men grappling with all their strength, trying to take the other one down. And that's what's going on. We need to wrestle. And it doesn't say if, in verse 13, the evil day comes. It says when. It's assumed. There will be evil that will come against us as believers in Jesus Christ. And on that day, having done all, we want to what? To stand firm. So you see, we need to stand firm because someone is trying to take you down. So that's Paul's exhortation for us, okay? But how? Here's the question. How are we going to stand firm? And we've already been told that our strength is in the Lord, that we are taking on His might. Twice we've been instructed to, to put on or to take up the whole armor of God. Now it's time to find out what that really means. So we've got the, the exhortation, stand firm. Let's talk about the explanation, which is the whole armor of God. Now, before going further into examining this whole armor of God, I want to offer a little heads up, and I want to let you know where I'm coming from. Now, you see, I think a lot of people know and they like this passage. But in some cases, I think they probably like it more the way we like the movie Gladiator. It's historical, it's dramatic, it's action-packed, you know. But that was purely for, for like, interest and entertainment. Well, this passage isn't for our interest and our entertainment. It's much more ominous, we could say. Why? Because it actually strikes closer to home. Not on a screen, but in reality. 
the reality of our daily lives. And, and at the same time, it's far more encouraging than a movie would be because it's encouraging and empowering for real life, for the struggles we're actually engaged in. And so I don't want you to get distracted by shiny Roman armor, by the analogy of this passage. This isn't a History Channel special. This is real. So you won't hear me getting too hung up in, you know, this part of the armor did this, and that part was made of that, that kind of a thing. Now, before I go on too far, I want to make sure that you see, Paul certainly does intend to paint a picture here to help the saints understand the truths of God. And he intentionally is drawing upon the imagery of Roman armor that his audience would have been completely familiar with. But the point is this. You see, that we have, what we have in hand, in reality, are these spiritual things. We have these things to be employed in the very real and ongoing battle against sin and temptation, the battle for human souls, and the battle for God's glory. So, my desire is not to draw your attention so much to what a belt is, but to truth. Not to what a breastplate or shoes are, but to righteousness, to the gospel of peace. Not to a shield, but to faith. Not to a helmet and a sword, but to salvation and the Word of God. These are our tools. So, let me make one more observation before moving forward. And I'll clue you in right now. This is key. You'll notice, if you'll notice, when when you take all of these things together, truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the Word of God, these things are like a constellation of, of concepts that are all related to one thing. They're all related to the gospel. These are the actual things God has made available to us through faith in the death of Jesus Christ as a complete and sufficient sacrifice for our sins. The resurrection of Jesus Christ as the ultimate victory over sin and death and the guarantee and the promise of eternal life to all who would repent and believe. We're talking about the armor of God. You see, this is God's armor. These are the things He provides for us, you see. We have it because we have Jesus. And we have Jesus because we are saved by grace through faith, not by works so that no one can boast. So all of these things come out of and are related to the gospel. And I need us to know that as we head into explaining and talking about each one. So we have Paul. He's given his exhortation to stand firm. He begins now his explanation of this armor of God. And I want to mention one final thing, which is he says not to put on one piece or this piece or that'll do and you won't need that. He says the whole armor of God. We need it all. We need everything God has to offer to us in Christ in order to stand firm. Are you with me? Okay, so let's look at these things that are laid out for us in this passage. And first thing we have in verse 14 is we have truth. Look again at verse 14. He says, Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Now, if we were to try and be simple and and, and perhaps try and say what is truth, I would say this. Truth is that which is. That sounds funny, but but, but think about that. Truth is, is true because it actually represents what really is. Right? It's empirical, existential, factual. This is reality. That's why we call it truth. We live in a day when truth is actually under fire, don't we? There's people who are saying, truth doesn't really matter, or maybe it doesn't really exist. And and you know what? If you wanted to jump in and have a philosophical debate about truth, you could be in the company of a friend of ours from the Scriptures, Pontius Pilate. Do you remember when Jesus was about to be crucified, and the two of them are standing there talking? And here he is, standing face to face with the Son of Man, and Jesus says something that is a huge statement. If you think about it, Jesus says, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Here it is. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. John 18, 37. And he had already previously stated the incredibly outrageous statement in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ is truth. And how does Pilate respond? John 18, 38, Pilate says to him, what is truth? I hope that's not our perspective as the scriptures call us to truth. 
And you know what? The Bible has a lot to say about truth. As we've already seen, and, and as Paul says earlier in Ephesians 4.21, the truth is in Jesus. John 17.17, 17, Jesus makes it clear that God's word is truth. John 8.32, we find out that truth will actually set you free. And in, right here in Ephesians, we discover that truth, Ephesians 5.9, is the fruit of light. It comes out of being light in Christ. And in Ephesians 1.13, that the word of truth is, guess what? The gospel of your salvation. So if we want to talk about what's true, we're talking about the things of God. We're talking about the gospel, the word of God. We're talking about Jesus himself. That's truth. So that's what we need, and that's what we have in Christ. Okay, so what does Paul mention next? Ephesians uh, 6.14, again, the second half. Now we've got the belt of truth, and then he says the breastplate of righteousness. Well, if truth is that which is, perhaps we can say, again, just to be simple, that righteousness is that which is right. And if you'll recall from Ephesians 6.1, we talked about it a few weeks ago, that right is defined by aligning with the will and the character of God himself. It's what God wants, who God is, and so we know it as expressed by his words, his law, You see, something is right because God says it's right. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about righteousness. And here's the bottom line. As residents and contributors of a fallen world, our biggest problem as humans is a righteousness problem. Without doing right and being right, we cannot be with our God, who's perfect in His righteousness. So what's the problem with that? Well, guess what? God is the source of life. And what's more, you were made to be in relationship with God, to enjoy Him and to glorify Him. That's your purpose on earth. So if your lack of rightness keeps you from the purpose for which you were made, and until you find a solution to your righteousness problem, you're going to continue on searching and groping and looking, trying to find something to fix this issue that that angst within you, and you're not going to find it because you can't fix your righteousness problem. And of course, here's the incredible news. Paul tells us in Romans 1.17 and 3.21 that in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. It's made available to us in Jesus Christ, and it's in Jesus Christ only because only He took on the penalty for our unrighteousness. So now, the promise of the gospel is that we who have given up all to trust in Jesus, we have become the righteousness of God. Are you kidding me? God has given us, in Christ, His righteousness, His perfection. Think of the gift that that is for us, that we get to wear like a breastplate. So the word of truth is the gospel of our salvation. And righteousness is ours because of the gospel. And next we find out that we're equipped with a readiness because of the gospel of peace, it says. Look at me with verse, in, in verse 15. He says, And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. You know, readiness, it's interesting to note that this is the thing that we've been given to put on here. It's not the gospel. It's actually a readiness that comes from the gospel. That's your thing to hold on to and to have. A readiness, or in other versions it might say a pre- preparation or preparedness, and that comes from the gospel of peace. So somehow, the good news of life instead of death through Jesus gives us a readiness, a quickness to move without delay, a cheerful willingness or an eagerness It's like swiftness, speed to move into action. That's what this is saying. So Paul refers to the good news here as the gospel of peace. And don't forget that when the Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, that sin is a rejection of His ways, of His rule over us. And so what that means is that we're all in rebellion against God as sinners. James 4.4 4 reminds us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. So anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world chooses to be an enemy of God himself, the maker of the universe. Now in Romans 5.1 says that because we've been justified by faith, 
We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is really big news. We were enemies, we were rebellious, we were against God, and God has made a way. He has sent His Son. He says, here's my perfect Son. No blemish, no spot, the perfect Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Here He is, He dies, and anyone who would believe in Him would receive, instead of the penalty of our death and our rebellion, we receive in Him His perfection. Now we have peace with God Himself. Unbelievable good news. And this peace with God gives us the ability to have peace with one another. We can have peace as the people of God. We can have peace crossing lines and barriers that before, no, we wouldn't normally relate with those people, but in Christ, those things go away, says Ephesians. And the dividing wall of hostility is brought down. And so we have peace with God and we have peace with one another. This is the gospel of peace. And it's interesting to find that this gospel, when we dwell on it, When we think on this amazing news, it's supposed to give to us or create in us a readiness. I'm at the ready. My feet are quick. This is what I've got. Here we go. And I I see it in two different ways. I hope this is helpful to you. First of all, it makes us ready to go. We are the proclaimers. We are the heralds. We get to be the ambassadors. And so we have the chance to go with this. And if it soaks in deep into our bones, the truths of this gospel, it should be that our feet are quick. Who can I tell? This is unbelievable. That person is sitting under God's judgment. But I can tell them the truth and it's going to set them free. Don't you see the urgency and the joy and and the readiness that can come from that? So it should fuel and and, and give us a a quickness to, to speak the truth of Jesus. Maybe you feel hesitant in your life sometimes to say, I don't know, I might just put that J word out there and it's going to be weird as soon as I say his name at work. Ah, We need to be ready. When we dwell on the gospel of peace, it will make us ready. But here's another way, and I think this is important too. You know, in battle, it's not just a matter of charging in. There are times when you need to not be in this spot. You've got to get over here, or you've got to go that way. You've got to dodge. You've got to get out of the way. And so the readiness can also be a readiness to flee. Now, don't hear me wrong. I didn't say to retreat, but I said to flee. And the scriptures teach us that there's a righteousness that comes from God. And if he gave us all the perfection, why then would we not do everything possible to flee from the evil desires of you to pursue that righteousness along with those who call on God out of a pure heart? So the scriptures give us a number of things that we're supposed to actually flee from. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 10, 14, flee from idolatry in your life, putting anything before God, worshiping anything other than God. 1 Timothy 6, 11, free, flee from the love of money. 2 Timothy 2, 22, I just mentioned, flee from all those evil desires that come from our youthfulness. We are to run. And so the righteousness that God's given us should compel us and make us quick, not only to go into the battle with the gospel and be quick to go, but also to know that in my own righteousness, I'm fleeing, I'm getting out of there because I don't want to fall back into the sin and the temptation that comes to me. There's a readiness. Do you see it? Okay. So what comes next? He mentions next faith. And so read with me again as we continue on. There's verse 15, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And then in verse 16, and in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. How key is this? Faith. We have it, and in every single circumstance, we must live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith, the scriptures tell us. Faith is what? It's trust, it's reliance, it's belief. Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And he goes on to say that without it, it's impossible impossible to please God. Why? Because we must believe that He even exists, and we must believe that He's a rewarder of those who would earnestly seek Him. That's why we need this trust and this faith. You know, it's interesting, faith as a key tool by definition. Here it is, there's something we're supposed to take up this shield of faith, and yet by definition it means reliance on something else, someone else. So the object of our protection isn't actually an object at all. It's actually the strength of another person or thing. It's the, the, your faith is only as good as the object in which you put your faith in. Am I right? 
And so, our faith is in Jesus, the Son of the living God, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, who upholds the universe by the word of His power. So you want to trust in something? You want some protection from something? You put your trust in Jesus. Jesus is the source, the the object of our faith. I want to flip to Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3, because this idea of a shield and hiding ourselves in God is not new. It's all over the Psalms and in other places in the Old Testament. Psalm 18, verses 1 through 3. He says this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. You want to know how to be saved from your enemy? You call upon the Lord. You don't say, I've got some little like thing, I'm going to just try and take it up myself. You're not relying on you. Faith is the reliance on Jesus Christ. That, according to the scriptures, will be the protection from every single flaming dart that comes your way from the enemy. Jesus is your shield. And I don't know if it makes you a little concerned, but the enemy is taking aim at you. He's got arrows, and he's looking at you, and he's, he's shooting them off, and you're in his crosshairs. And here come temptations, and here come lies, and here come conflicts, and problems, and difficulties. And maybe you're trying to think that, oh, that's a human thing. No, it's not. There's spiritual realities behind that, and those things are coming your way And you can extinguish every single one of those in your trust, in your reliance, in your dependence on God Almighty through Jesus Christ. You have a shield of faith. Okay. Well, let's see what we have next. The next thing that's referred to is salvation. He says, Stand therefore, having put on the belt of truth, having the breastplate of righteousness. You've got your feet ready with the gospel of peace. You've got your shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And in verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Salvation. This refers to actually being in some sort of danger. Salvation means being saved. So you can't be saved if you're not in danger, right? And if you're in danger and you get saved from it, we talk about salvation. Well, according to Ephesians, we weren't just in danger We were dead in our trespasses and sins in which we once walked. But God, from Ephesians chapter 2, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He's loved us, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we've been saved. You have salvation. So in this battle, you need to be able to say confidently, based on the truth of the Word of God, I am saved. I am saved, and I hope that you can say that this morning with full confidence, not questioning, not wondering, because you know, you know the gospel. You know God is real. You know His righteousness is real. You know your sin has separated you. You know that darkness. You know the consequences that are awaiting you, and you turn to Jesus. And you said, Jesus, you can have all of me. I confess my sin. I make you Lord and Savior of my life. Take me, make me a new creation. And the person who has done that can say confidently on the Word of God that I am saved. You have salvation. Let's look at the last thing that's mentioned here, the Word of God. It refers specifically to the utterances of God, the inspired written Word of God. I looked just to kind of out of curiosity. Again, I'm not a Greek guy, but there's some interesting things there. Logos is a word for word. And Jesus in John chapter 1 is the living word. That's logos. Well, right here the word is rima, which means something that's been uttered, something that's been spoken. And so this is the words that have proceeded from the mouth of God, the living word of God. That's what it means when it says we have the sword of the Spirit, which is these utterances, the words of God himself. And Jesus taught us in Matthew 4, 4, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every one of these utterances, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And we found out later in John chapter 6, verse 68, Jesus was teaching and it was hard and people were going, what am I going to do? And John says to him, Jesus, where else would we go? You have the words of life and peace. 
And we also find out in Romans 10, 17, faith comes through hearing, and hearing comes through what? Through the Word, through the Word of Christ. And so all of these things, we've got the Word of God informing us. This is the basis. How are you going to know truth if you don't know what God has said? How are you going to have faith if you don't know what this is all about because God has informed us? How are you going to know about your salvation unless you've been taught it by the Word of God? How are you going to speak words of faith unless you know the things of God? And so the Word of God is so key. It's the only offensive weapon mentioned in this list. Everything else is about defense, about what's coming our way. And we have here the Word of God, the things that He has said, and we can stand on those things and know those things and let them give us life. Jesus battled with the Word of God against Satan himself. Satan came to tempt, and every time he tempted, Jesus responded with, this is what God's Word says. And so can we. We have the Word of God. And so... It says that it's not only the sword, but it's the sword of the Spirit. I'm not going to pretend like I quite have a whole grasp of what exactly that means, but you know what? We need the Spirit of God to lead us into all truth. That much we know. John 14, 26, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's saying the Spirit's going to come. And he says when he does, he's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have taught you or said to you. John 16, 8, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. So we call it the sword of the Spirit because not only do we just have words on a page, but we have the living God Himself to help us know them, to help us understand them, to bring them deep into our heart and let them change us. And so we need to give God the opportunity to let His Word work in our lives and to hold it up as important, as an important thing. If only we could just grasp the importance of the Word of God. You might read 10 more minutes tomorrow morning than you would have otherwise. You might end your day with an hour of reading in the Word of God instead of an hour of TV. There's so many things you might do if it just sunk in how badly we need life from the Word of God. This is food. This is what we need. And I'm not trying to come down on you and say you don't read your Bible enough. Listen, there's no such thing as enough. You're going to keep digging, and you're going to keep digging, and you're not going to get to the bottom. And God is going to use His Spirit, but listen, we, we also can't just ignore it, let it collect dust on our shelves, and expect that somehow the Word is going to find its way into our lives. So we have this armor, all of these wonderful things. We have, let's review it, verse 14. What do we have? We have a breastplate of righteousness. Where did that come from? That's from God. We have shoes fitted on our feet that give us the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. We have, in all circumstances, the ability to take up the shield of faith and to trust and rely on God. We have for ourselves not only that, but the helmet of salvation. We have the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Think of all that we have in the gospel in Jesus Christ. This, like I said earlier, we're talking about the armor of God. This is His stuff given to us. And we have it because we have Jesus. Now hear me as we come to the close of this, because now we've talked about the armor. We haven't gotten to the action. Nothing here has told us what to do yet. There's a whole thing about taking up the armor of God, but the action here is praying, and I'm going to get to that in just a second. But I need you to hear me because you cannot get up in the morning and work this out for yourself. In your own ability, you can't get up and produce truth and righteousness and gospel and faith and salvation. Now you might be thinking, yeah, honors, but it says here as a commander, as an instruction, put on the whole armor of God or take up the whole armor of God. Well, you know what? This is the same thing that Paul did earlier in Ephesians chapter 4 when he told us to put off the old self and put on the new self in Ephesians 4.22. He talks of the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, And in Ephesians 4.24, he says the new self is created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, the old self is old because it's old. It's gone. The new self, we call it that because it's new and it's who we actually are. And so although he's saying, put on this new person, behave in this new way, he's not telling us something to do as much as be who you already are. Do you remember when we talked about that in Ephesians? So our behaviors and our actions in the gospel, these things of putting away 
untruth and putting away sexual immorality and whatever else it might be, that's not just us doing that for ourselves. God does that. God's done that. Now we get to live in it. Is that making sense? And in the same way, the armor is there for you. Take it up. Be who you already are. This is your identity in Christ. So, just like in Ephesians 5.8, at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk then as children of light. In the same way, he's saying, you have armor. You've got everything you need in Jesus. Now take it up and just go be who you are. So, if that's not the action, what is? If it's not, you know, get up in the morning and try to do some little ditties to like clothe myself all up in this because I already have it in Jesus, what is the action? Well, first of all, you've got to see the centrality of Jesus. I hope it's come through to this point. Jesus is it, so you press into Jesus. You put your trust and faith completely in Him, not just for salvation, not just the day that you said, Jesus, save me, I'm a rotten sinner. That day's important. But every day after you trust in Jesus. Can I get an amen? You guys awake? Come on, we need Jesus. And if you haven't gotten it by now, you need to before we wrap up Ephesians. The key to this book is one little phrase, in Him, in Him, in Him. The whole thing, the whole entire system hinges on Jesus. That's why we're trying to make him non-ignorable. That's why we're holding up his name. We have nothing, we have no hope, no salvation if there was no Jesus. So, we lean into Jesus and then there's an action for us. Look at verse 18 with me. Now he's telling us something to do. Verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Now here we go. Here's something for you to take home. Here's where this gets practical. What am I going to do now that I know that there's a whole spiritual battle? Hey, honors, I don't quite understand the, the, the background, this, this spiritual world. That's okay. You don't have to understand it. I know who I am in Christ. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be praying. Now, I want to call out six elements of wrestling in prayer that we see from this scripture. And I'm hoping that this is where you get some stuff to kind of take home and know, okay, I can do that. First thing, praying at all times. At all times. Listen, this is not just your little prayer time in the morning. That's great. Start the day and thanks to the Lord. But we are to be praying at all times. Pray in your car. Pray in the shower. Pray while you're shoveling the snow. Pray while you're walking from here to there. Pray when you're about to head into that meeting. At all times, you have an open door, an open invitation to come before the throne of grace boldly because of Jesus and to tell Him what you need and to talk to the Lord. So when you say, I'll pray for you, do it right then. Why not? Pray at all times. When you are asked, you can go into the community and when you're, you're there and you're hearing from the waitress about all the difficulties she's facing, you know what you can say? Hey, can I just pray for you? You see? There's no time that's wrong to pray. It says pray at all times. When you're heading into that meeting and you're worried about what's going to happen, yeah, it's your work and yeah, there's stress involved, whisper a prayer on the way in. God be my strength. God give me wisdom. God let me speak something that represents you well in this context. So whisper a prayer when you start a hard conversation. If you encounter a child, a problem with your child, don't just say, oh, I'm so worried, I'm so stressed, I'm all lathered up. Pray. Pray at all times. Do you see? So we can incorporate prayer into our lives by praying at all times. What else does it say? It says pray at all times in the Spirit. Now let me try and define this a little bit for you because I think it's possible to get this and you're like, that sounds weird, Anders. Like, is there some sort of like you know, a weird little spiritual place we get, and we get all praying in the Spirit. Let me give you three things that I think this means in the context of this passage. Praying in the Spirit means praying in God's Word. Did you notice the verse we just came out of? What did it say? It said, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If this is of the Spirit, and we are to pray in the Spirit, am I too far off to say that A plus B equals C? Pray in the Word of God. You don't know what to say? Then go to the Psalms. Let them help you have some words to pray. You don't know who to or how to pray for somebody? You don't know how to pray for Calvary Nampa? Then go to Ephesians chapter 1 and pray that prayer. 
that God would open up the eyes of our hearts, that we'd know the hope to which He's called us. There's great content for us in the Word of God. There's truth. And what's the point of praying prayers to Almighty God if they're misinformed? God, do this or do that, when, guess what? Maybe He doesn't want to, and the, the Word would have told us that if we were informed by the truth. So we pray in the Spirit, which means we pray in God's Word. We can use it. The other thing that I think it means is that it means we pray in God's will. So it's in His Word, it's in His will. We don't want to just pray for things that we want. What did Jesus teach us to pray? Our, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we want what you want for Calvary Church Nampa. We want what you want in our family, in our lives. Not what we want. So if we're praying in the Spirit, let the Spirit of God in you, who indwells you as a believer in Jesus Christ, let you align with the things that God is actually after, His will. Does that make sense? And then thirdly, we pray in His Word, we pray in His will, we also pray with, with the Holy Spirit. It's His way. Let's be conscious of His presence. I think that's what it means to pray in the Spirit at all times. We know that God is with us. He's never far from us. He'll never leave you and forsake you. So with, in communion with the Holy Spirit, we can pray. Does that make sense? So that's one of the things. We pray at all times. We pray in the Spirit. The third thing, we pray with all kinds of requests. Look at it. It says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. This means anything you have to say, you bring it up before the Lord. Prayers are the things we say to God. Supplication is not only our lists of requests, but it's actually also us asking humbly and earnestly. Earnest prayers. Let your heart fuel what you're saying to God. That's supplication. I'm, I'm putting this supplication before you because I'm humbly and earnestly praying to you, God. And the, the doors are wide open for what that is. Is that a, a healing need? Is that something that, that you have a, a, a great concern in your life? All kinds of prayers and requests God is asking us to bring it all to Him. And the Scripture even promises that if you'll not be anxious about everything, but in everything, through prayer and through these petitions, you present those requests to God with thanksgiving, and guess what we get? We get the peace of God. It goes beyond what we can even understand. So all kinds of requests. The fourth thing, we're praying with alertness. See, it says praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Keep alert. Towards that end, we want to stay alert. And so we need to be attentive and ready and awake and watchful. Jesus was in the garden with his disciples, and he asked them, hey, stay here while I go over there and pray. And he came back, and they were sleeping. He's like, couldn't you pray just one hour with me? He said, the body is willing, I mean, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So there's an attentiveness that we need to have. And it's not only to what's going on sort of around us in our circumstances, but it's spiritually. Let me say this. If something doesn't seem right, something's off, you may not understand why, but what are you going to do? Pray. Pray in that moment when something seems off. What's going on in my household? Me and my wife, we're going like this, and I don't get it. That feels like it's coming out of nowhere. Hold on. We need to pray. You see, that's alertness. That's being attentive to what's going on around us. And instead of getting all fussy and worried, no, no, no. This is, this is, we know that it's not a wrestling against flesh and blood. It's a wrestling spiritually. And so we're going to stop. We're going to talk to God. Don't know what to pray for? Sometimes we don't know what to pray for because we're too self-involved. We're only noticing ourselves, and so we don't notice what's going on around us. So when we have alertness, it's about looking outward and paying attention to what's going on far beyond our own circumstances. Does that make sense? He also says to pray with all perseverance. Do you guys remember the, the, the widow, the persistent widow that Jesus taught about? She needed justice, and she banged on the door, give me justice against my adversary, give me justice. And Jesus says, you know what? Pray like that. Keep going. You didn't get your answer tomorrow? Pray it again next week. You didn't get your answer next month? Then pray it again and keep going. God wants us to be persistent in our prayers. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Don't be discouraged if you don't see an answer right away. Keep praying. And then finally he says, praying not only persistently, but also making supplication for all the saints. 
So what does this mean? Does this mean that every time I sit down to pray, I've got a prayer list that's as long as the number of people I've ever met in my whole entire life who love Jesus? I don't think so, practically. But I would say this. Don't reserve your prayers just for your inner circle or the few people that you know and like best. Maybe there's somebody else in the community of the saints that you don't know well, but you know they're going through something. Pray for all the saints. Pray for all the saints. Leave no one out. There's no one among God's people who God wouldn't have us be willing and able to pray for. Maybe that person isn't like you. Maybe that person doesn't even speak your language. Pray for that person. I'll give you a couple of examples. It can go beyond our pews here, although I hope that it's very active in our community here. But pray for the Calvary family of churches. There are other pastors who are saying, Jesus loves the church. This one might close its doors. We don't want that. That's going to be not glorifying to God. We want to glorify God. So pray for that pastor. He needs you. Pray for that congregation. I got a letter just this week from somebody at Calvary Inglewood, somebody I've never met in my life. And she gave me about two pages of the things she was praying for us and for me specifically straight out of the Word of God. Do you know how much encouragement I got out of that? Do you know how much more fuel there is in the tank when you know somebody's praying for you? So pray for all the saints. Pray for the kingdom people here in the valley, beyond our denomination. Pray that God would be glorified, that something would move here in the Treasure Valley that would glorify God, and it doesn't have to be in a Baptist church. We have partners. Let's pray for them. Pray for the saints who are laboring in other places around the globe. You're going to see there's one board over in the admin building. There's going to be one here that's for missions. Look at those faces. Read those prayer letters. Lift those people up. Pray for all the saints. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, Anders, my prayer life is starting to feel a little kind of small, and you're going to just load me over. I'm going to get up. I'm going to start praying. I'm going to not get to eat. I'm not going to get to do anything. You're going to fill my whole entire day with nothing but praying. (laughs) Hey, go for it. It's going to be a great day. No, listen, listen, this plays out in real life, okay? Jesus knows. So there's all kinds of clues here for how we can be praying, but this is our tool. This is all we've got. This is the action. You want to get into the battle? You want to get all serious about the things of the Lord? Great, then take it to the enemy in prayer because only God can win these battles. That's why it's prayer. We're talking to the one who can do the things that we need. We're talking to the one that has the word of of rebuke that the enemy is going to listen to. He doesn't give a rip about who you are. But when you say in the authority and the power of Jesus' name, Lord, you rebuke this thing, trust me, the enemy has no choice but to leave. And so we win when we take it to God and he fights for us. And that's why prayer is our tool. That's what we have. I'm going to give you... Just a couple last little thoughts and ideas to make this practical, and then I'm going to wrap this up. First of all, Thursday mornings from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., we're here praying, nothing else. You're very welcome to come join us for five minutes, ten minutes for the whole hour. We want to be a praying church, so uh, Thursday mornings at 6 a.m. or 6 to 7, come on in and pray with us. Prayer walking. Our core team building up to the launch, has been given maps and areas of our our zone around here and said, we want to prayer walk that area. We want to go to those places, see some things that bring up ideas and pray for those families and and maybe there's some conversations that happen. If you want to join in with that, come talk to me. Come talk to Shauna. We'll give you a map. We'll tell you a place that nobody's praying for yet and you'll be set up and you go and you pray, maybe even once a month or something. Just go to that area and pray. Pretty practical, right? Pray as a family. Find other ways to do more than just say, thank you, Lord, for our food. I hope you do that. That's provided by God. Pray every meal. That's not just ritualistic. That's Jesus did that. He gave you that meal, so say thanks. But you know what? You have the opportunity to lean in even further with your family. Pray as a couple. Pray when you're going to end the day. And I would also say there's a lot of ways to keep it organized. Anders, I don't remember all this stuff. You know what? I'm not real good, but I got this little phone here and it keeps some notes and we're there in community group and I'm trying to actually find out. You want me to pray for that? I'm going to pray for that. And you can do the same. There's better tools than what I use, so dig it up. Go for it. Have a list. I think being organized doesn't make it less spiritual. I think it just means that we're taking it seriously. So I hope that we're together at this point. 
you know, at this point, we've, we've come through this whole thing, and the exhortation was what? Stand firm in God's strength, not in yours. How are we going to do it? We're going to be armored up. Guess what? That's not even ours either. That's Jesus. What is our action? We're going to pray at all times, in the Spirit, on all occasions, for all kinds of people and all kinds of requests. That's our part. So what are we going to do? Are we going to go out and pick a fight spiritually? I'd say this, yes and no. No, here, we're not going to go out getting over-interested in spiritual matters and looking for a demon behind every rock and, and all of that kind of stuff. We're not going to get into this paralyzing fear that, that there's darkness all around. That's true. And yes, there are spiritual realities, but that's not what we're going to do as we head out to pick a fight with some demon we, do, we don't know anything about. We're not going to be proud and acting as though we fully understand the spiritual realm. We don't need to go out on some kind of crusade against mankind because our flesh, we're not battling flesh and blood. So we don't have to go out there and take care of everybody else's sin for them. That's not the battle we go and pick that fight. Instead, listen to me, the gates of hell are not going to prevail against God's church. So we will rescue and we will pluck from the fire and we will tear down strongholds. We will live in Jesus' ministry to, to the, have good news be proclaimed to the poor and proclaim liberty to the captives and set free those who are oppressed. We will fight sin and temptation. We're not going to let that stuff own us any longer because we don't have to. We have been given divine tools to fight those things. We can flee, we can stand, we have righteousness, we have salvation, we have faith in Jesus, we have truth, we have everything we need. So we will fight sin and temptation, and we will take a wartime mindset. This is not a life of ease that just says, I'm heading on home and everything's easy peasy from here on. No, we engage, but we engage in this spiritual battle, and the key way we do it from Ephesians chapter 6 is we do it in prayer. So I don't know about you, but I've been preparing this sermon, and guess what? My prayer life is on the docket. It's time to take a look at that and find some ways to, to lean into that. And I hope that you'll be able to do the same. I hope that you'll be able to find some, some specific ways. Grab one idea. Listen, don't get all, don't worry, this is grace. So don't get down on yourself if you feel like it's not enough. It's never enough, so that's okay. That's why we came to Jesus in the first place. But pick one thing, focus on it, and just go for it. Just, just work that one new thing into your habits, into your life, and see what God will do with it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, I love you. I love you because you've loved me first, and you're so patient. You've given kindness and love and grace, and that has drawn us. So in this moment, I just worship you. I just thank you. Now, God, we are the people of God and, and the saints made holy by you. And now, God, we are not in a time of ease, but we are in a battle. And we're crying out to you. Jesus, be our all. Save us not only from sin from the day we repented, but save us today and tomorrow from the evil one. Help us, Father, I pray, to let these words of truth from your word make us something, make us strong, because we want to endure, and we want to stand firm. So we're looking to you, Christ, for that every day. In Jesus' name, amen.